Right. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to May's Armchair Travel event. I hope everyone has been enjoying today's sunshine like we've had here in Cambridge today. Um, I also hope that you very much enjoy this evening's talk. This evening is a this event is hosted by Distant Horizons, who is one of our longest standing tour operators. If anyone joined us in March, we'll, we, you'll know that we'll be celebrating 25 years of partnering with Distant Horizons this year. I'm delighted to introduce and welcome this evening's speaker, Rame, uh, Nirvana Ramel, who has had who has led many tours for us for the Alumni Travel Programme. Just to remind you all, all the armchair travel events are recorded, including this evening's event. And if you have missed any of the talks we've previously held, then please do look on the Cambridge Alumni website. They're all on there for you to enjoy. I'd now like to hand over to Daniel from Distant Horizons. Well, thanks very much, Claire. Yeah, my name is Daniel Moore. As Claire has said, I help manage the, the cultural travel company Distant Horizons. We specialize in scholar and company journeys to all parts of Asia, North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, um, and the Americas. Uh, we, we try and focus on slightly less visited destinations within those regions. And we try and do slightly more unusual itineraries and build in special experiences for the travelers. These might be uh, meetings with uh, local academics, uh, with uh, politicians, journalists, editors. It might be uh, visits to, to private homes, to private collections, uh, meals in private homes. It, it, it might, might be food and wine tastings. Um, as Claire says, we've been working with Oxford and Cambridge University for 25 years. Um, and, and in that time, we probably organized you know, getting on for 300 journeys for the alumni, maybe taking in around uh, 3,000 alumni in that time. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points, if I may, before we start on, on the main talk. Um, definitely encourage questions. Please do ask questions. Um, but if you could use your chat box to do that, I'll try and collate those questions and put those to Nirvana um, at the end of the talk. If you would just permit me a couple of minutes to, to canter through some of the journeys that Cambridge are planning for 2023, or at least the remainder of 2023. Um, we have a, a journey to Central Asia, uh, accompanied by uh, Dr. Ian Shearer. Uh, he's probably accompanied seven or eight journeys to the Middle East, to Persia, to Central Asia. Uh, th this journey will go right into the heart of the region, to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. It will take in some of the sort of fabled cities of Bukhara, Samarkand, Kiva, uh, and also the spectacular landscapes of Tajikistan. Uh, Dr. Chris Collar, who's uh, accompanied several walking trips for the alumni over the years, uh, he, he will be in, on the Amalfi Coast uh, uh, and accompanied too by a, a local expert and guide, Lucia Ferrara, uh, who certainly knows the walks and, and, and the region incredibly well. She's uh, she's born of many generations of Amalfi Coast families, and uh, as well as the walk, she probably knows a, a, a reasonable place to eat and drink along the way. And in September of the same month, uh, Professor Jay Lewis of Oxford University, uh, he will be accompanying a party of alumni to Japan, uh, to the main island of, 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 of Japan, Honshu Island, and, and that itinerary takes in most of the major cultural and historical highlights of the island. And then in October of this year, uh, Zara Fleming, who's probably accompanied about eight or nine trips for the alumni since her first trip, I think, back in 2007, uh, she'll be with a party in Bhutan, uh, a magical and uh, spectacular kingdom right in the heart of the Himalayas. And then a slightly unusual itinerary uh, based on, on, on civil walks, which will allow the party to, to, to get off the beaten path in Bhutan if, if, if there is such a thing as a, Bhutan, a beaten path in Bhutan. Um, and it also takes in a couple of very lively and colorful festivals, uh, which for, for many Bhutanese is, is, is a high point of, of the social calendar. And then finally, uh, Nirvana Ramel, today's lecturer, she, she will have 10 days or so in Burgundy or something a party in Burgundy. Um, and uh, as we will hear from Nirvana Burgundy, of course, well known for its wine, it is perhaps more than any region in, in France, a, a perfect union of, of history, culture, and nature. If, if any of those trips look of interest, then please 
to Car Distant Horizons on info at distanthorizons.co.uk, and we would be delighted to send you a full in-depth itinerary of the trip, which will have details of hotels, sightseeing, flights, etc. But thank you for that, and, and if I may, I will now hand over to Sir Nirvana to tell us more about Burgundy uh, and uh, its history and culture. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you uh, to Claire also uh, for inviting me to present again to the alumni. Uh, I, I am Croatian by birth, by studies, and I was first intrigued by Burgundy as a student of art history a long time ago at the Zagreb University. Um, it was the well of Moses that took my fancy, and I will finish um, the talk today with the well of Moses. Um, I didn't know really how to put it into the lecture, and I thought that I just simply have to, so whether you like it or not, you will see it at the end. Um, but in my mind, and I suspect like in, in many minds, uh, Burgundy was more or less synonymous with France. So I, I suspect that's how people said. And when I didn't pay much attention to it at, at the time, you know, I studied academically and so on. But when I moved to Ferney Voltaire on the outskirts of Geneva six years ago, um, I first undertook the pilgrimage to Dijon to see the Well of Moses, um, which as I said, took my fancy uh, 20 odd years ago, and uh, I was absolutely enchanted. It was better than I ever imagined it could be. And uh, it wasn't just the well of Moses. As I travel, and uh, I keep traveling as uh, uh, often as I can, just over the mountain here, uh, uh, Burgundy, um, I am absolutely enchanted by, by the whole region, and, and there's now a full-blown love affair between me and Burgundy. Um, it's very much uh, uh, going strong, and um, I, I feel that every time I go, there's more to see, there's more to discover. There, there's, it's, a, it's a region of unbelievable beauty, but also of unbelievable complexity. And me being a Croat from the Balkans, that really appeals to me, <laughs> that incredible historical complexity of Burgundy. Um, this complexity, of course, uh, and its historical uh, importance has been recognized um, by, by the historian and the territory um, has been an important political player um, ever since the Burgundians arrived, uh, which was quite a while ago. Let me share the screen with you. So as you can see, there was this um, ancient kingdom of Burgundians uh, that was somewhere there around the year 500. And uh, the, 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 the story is that they moved really from the Rhine region uh, down there, pushed by the Alemanni, the Germans. Um, the, before that, they were there, somewhere there in Poland, and there's a suggestion, but the proof is somewhat scant, uh, that they actually arrived from the island of Bonhorn in uh, the Baltic Sea, which is today in Denmark. Um, and that, that, that's the also origin of their name, of Bonhorn, Burgund, uh, Burgundians. Um, in any case, we find them here, we find the kingdom of Burgundians going um, for about 100 odd years before it is completely swallowed into a newly established uh, uh, Frankish uh, kingdoms and, and further on the empires. And uh, as such, it, it uh, continues to exist. The name also continues to exist and be acknowledged by the Franks. Um, and then we find it uh, at the uh, Treaty of Verdun, where, uh, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the whole Charlemagne's empire was divided uh, among three of his grandsons. And here um, we have the... The, the, the happy occasion where the uh, Louis the Pious, the Charlemagne son, is uh, blessing his his three sons, and uh, there's there's Lot, uh, the, there's Lothar. He's the he's the youngest one, and the whole the whole area, the whole Frankish great empire is now divided into West and East Francia, and in the middle of it there is 
I'm sorry, there's Lotharingia. And somewhere in there, in this newly uh, established areas is Burgundy. A mild problem here that we have is, well, on the west and on the east, we have, I wouldn't call them homogenous as such, but at least <laughs> they are of the similar origins, these these peoples, these these tribes, clans, they, they already have established um, allegiances where Lotharingia or this, this middle uh, uh, Francia, it, it, it's stretched, as you can see, all the way from the north, from the low countries, uh, uh, down to Rome. And you can just imagine that it is very difficult uh, uh, to maintain any kind of control over this, this entire area. So um, it, it's when you look at this map, it's almost like a harbinger of the power struggles between the French and Habsburg royal houses that are going to rattle Europe continuously for the next millennium, um, except perhaps for the short golden era between the 14th and 15th centuries when the Duchy of Burgundy reestablished uh, itself and held these great powers in check. You can also see on this map that the Low Countries and the Burgundians had vague, not very strong, but they, they already had some political and historical connections before this Burgundian golden era that we'll touch upon later on. So because they were packed in this in the same kingdom. And um, because this this middle was quite problematic, there were further treaties, there were three more petitions and uh, by the ninth century, we have this situation where on the left, we have the Duchy of Burgundy. On the right, we have the County of Burgundy. And uh, down there, we have the, the Burgundy or Lower Burgundy or Southern Burgundy, which is eventually just going to get swallowed into the Kingdom of Provence. So I'm just leaving that bit. But this particular division here that follows the, the River Somme, it still, it still actually exists. Um, and what is also interesting when we look at this map is to keep in mind that what was in the, what was the Duchy of Burgundy um, remains faithful to the West or to the French crown in one way or another. But what is the county of Burgundy becomes the free county of Bourgogne or later on just free county, French Comte, which is then faithful all the way until 1678 to the Holy Roman uh, Emperor or the, or the Habsburgs. And then down south, where now you are reading Bourgogne says Jurin, um, that is going to really be under the influence of Savoy or Savoyards, uh, who will have um, the capital in, in uh, Turin. They will also be on the side of the Habsburgs. Later on, there will be a kingdom of Sardinia and so on. So where we look today, where we we, we, we thinking today about this area and we think France, France, of course, it's France. For so long, this area has been divided among different powers for so long. It danced between these different powers. And the people in there were also coming from different areas with different allegiances and so on. So when you go to, uh, to Burgundy and you travel around the Burgundy, the, the whole Frenchness of it is not necessarily that pronounced as you would, uh, um, as you would encounter it. Somewhere, somewhere else, and obviously there's a good historical reason for this. And um, I love maps; they tell us a lot. Now, at the um, during this dark ages, the Carolingian Empire and so off, uh, and so on, Burgundy was operating within this within these uh, um, divisions and so on. Um, but uh, these. Uh, these borders were a bit problematic also because they cut this Burgundian territory in two, as I've already uh, uh, shown, and uh, uh, they've created they've, they've created a, um, a lot of infighting between the local nobility, lords and so on. They were not exactly, they were too far from, from the focuses of power, both in Germany or, or, in, or in France. So this 
Middle Kingdom was stuck. It was turbulent. Uh, um, it had difficult geography with all the rivers, the lakes, the the, the Alps, the the mountains. So. Perhaps it's not then surprising that in the early medieval age, it was the great abbeys of Burgundy that wielded more power than any secular ruler in the area. So we, at the beginning, we started with the kingdom. Um, by the uh, 10th, 11th century, we're not actually looking at dukes. We're not looking at counts. We're not looking at faraway kings. We are looking at the abbeys. And none were more powerful than the great Benedictine Abbey of Cluny, which was founded in uh, 1910, and then followed by the um, reaction network of Cistercian abbeys uh, that developed from the mother house uh, in Citeaux near Dijon. Both instigated a series of reforms that would uh, reverberate through Christendom for centuries to come. Cluny was a trailblazer from its founding moment. Um, everything about it was new. Um, and uh, the, the su like, surprising thing was its donation charter, um, which was received from the uh, William the First Duke of Aquitaine, uh, because the monastery was released from the dominance of any secular or church authority except the Pope. Um, and even Pope couldn't seize the property, uh, divide it or, or give it to someone else uh, or appoint the abbot without the consent of the monks. So uh, where other abbeys, they were usually founded from the donations of, of nobility of rich people or bishops or, or whatever, but in one way or another, whoever founded them would find a way to exert certain uh, power over them. Uh, Cluny was free. Um, all William asked for in return was for the monks to pray for his soul and the souls of his family. And this was hugely unusual um, at the time. So with the Pope across the Alps in Italy, um, this really meant that the monastery was more or less independent. Um, and at the time, the papacy was also experiencing some serious setbacks on account of the Great Schism um, and also a, a number of saucy scandals relating to different popes. Uh, so the abbots and monks of Cluny were soon seen as the leaders of the Western Christian world. Many kings, rather than going all the way down to Italy, uh, finding pope in trouble in Rome or not even in Rome, um, something, uh, they were turning to the abbots of Cluny for their spiritual leadership. And other monasteries quickly sprung up across Europe, supporting Cluniac reforms um, and offering their allegiance to the abbot of Cluny. Now, in, in text, in, in literature, these Cluniac reforms are usually summarized as the restoration of the traditional monastic life, encouragement of art and education, and caring for the poor. But I, I'd like to just share with you what that that actually meant in practical terms and what was their long-term effect uh, in general and why Burgundy is therefore so important. <clears throat> now, the organizational structure of Cluny was um, interesting because it had an abbot and uh, then all these other abbeys that sprung supporting Cluny uh, reforms, they would have had priors appointed by the Cluny abbot. and. Uh, the the so the abbot was centrally ruling um and then he would move promote demote his men to the positions across this cluniac network of monasteries as he saw fit uh, so this this is if you'd like first proper kind of project management organizational management that we have in europe since the roman empire and it became very quickly a base uh, for administration of newly emerging states, um, Duchy of Burgundy and the Valois will more or less copy the, the Cluniac setup. Um, the uh, Saint Benedict rule, ora et labora, meaning prayer and work, was no longer seen as a necessary part of a uh, monk's life. So manual labor was outsourced to serfs or laymen and paid labor, um, and the full focus was placed on liturgy and perpetual prayer. And this had several consequences because uh, Cluniac monks 
became perceived as the holiest, most pious uh, lot, um, absolute professionals in the field of praying for souls, which meant that if you wanted someone to pray for your soul, you wanted to get the best of the prayers, so they would uh, uh, they, they would receive far more donations than any other abbeys <clears throat> in this field. Um, and uh, then, you know, not surprising here in this whole setup, they also encouraged veneration of pious and generous rulers who were providing them with these donations, uh, and thus they were strengthening the idea of the divine right of the king. Now, as they no longer had to bother with the carpentry or digging their cabbages, uh, they could specialize in things they were good at. Uh, so um, Clooney had this organization that I already mentioned. It was not too dissimilar from modern corporations. You know, they had the accounts department, HR, export, import, foreign relations, public relations, and so on. Um, so they, they, and they had all of these educated now monks, they were sent across Europe and they were everywhere as bishops, as legates, as cardinals. And as such, they were able to influence greatly various rulers and, and courts, um, not just in their own favor, but simply exert sort of a, a civilizing influence on Europe, which was emerging from the dark ages. Because the central activity of a Cluniac monastery was the liturgy, um, and uh, it was believed that uh, the state of grace was easier to achieve in inspiring surroundings. This resulted in a great patronage of uh, art and architecture. So they've built these massive, massive abbeys, abbey churches, and of course they had to be decorated and every aspect of this holy life had to be made as beautiful as possible. Um, so there was a vast amount of fine and decorative arts made for Cluniac uh, abbeys. Um, and this slowly led to development of Gothic style and obviously to promotion of arts and crafts across uh, uh, Europe. Now, you know, if, if you look at this fabulous goblet, which uh, once belonged to um, uh, Abbot Suger of the Royal Abbey of Saint-Denis, which was a Cluniac Abbey. Um, it was a Abbey of the French Kings. Uh, one can perhaps easily imagine then uh, transubstantiation of wine into blood of Christ is easier in this chalice than in a, in a pewter cup. So it was this opulence, the splendor, the, the, the glory of the Catholic Church, um, as we know, that, that really started with the Cluniacs um, and their preference for all things beautiful. Uh, with both the number of monks and the status of Cluny increasing, the abbots kept expanding the, the, both the, the Mother Abbey and the church. Um, so the third abbey church, which was completed in 1130, um, ended up being the largest church in Europe, and it stayed the largest church in Europe for about 500 years until the construction of St. Peter's in Rome was uh, completed. Uh, not much remains of it uh, today, um, because it was quite neglected in the end, and then uh, during the French Revolution, it, it was almost completely dismembered. Uh, but you can see it here digitally reconstructed by the students of the engineering school, um, which is uh, situated here in this uh, um, renovated part uh, of the abbey in your bottom left corner. So out of the abbey, all of this is reconstructed. There are some um, foundations and wall here, and this part still remains without, without the roof. Um, you, but with this reconstruction, you can see how the church would have dwarfed its entire surroundings and, and inspired awe in its time. Even today, when you go there and when you grasp the sheer size of the place, it, it, is, it is really uh, uh, awe-inspiring. Um, and I can just imagine, you know, the people in the medieval age arriving there and seeing this. Mm. Now, the, the sheer size, um, especially the height of the Cluny's third church, um, inspired its builders to experiment with Romanesque barrel vaulting. 
this method of construction, the barrel vaulting, does not really allow for window openings uh, because the, the walls are used as a supporting supporting structure for the for the walls. So that, that's why the earlier Romanesque churches tend to be rather dark. Uh, but in Cluny uh, number three and, and in the nearby church in Turno, they managed to open the wall with three windows above the barrel arch. So they figured out that if they still leave the wall supporting and heavy, they can try and give it a go up here to let some light. Because now that they were reaching for the skies, um, it was no longer acceptable to be in such a dark church. It also didn't really speak much of a Lord's grace to be in a perpetual darkness. Um, so this was the first step in thinking and engineering towards a gothic construction of non-bearing walls and, and large windows, which will follow very, very soon. And actually the first time that it happened was in the Abbot Sugar um, Abbey of Saint Denis that I've just mentioned earlier with that with the chalice. Um, of course, now every action has a reaction. So a group of Benedictine monks outraged by the excesses of Cluny founded Citeaux Abbey uh, near Dijon in 1098. So on one side we have Cluny, which is closer to uh, our Lyon or Macon uh, on, on, the, on one side. And then here we have Citeaux, closer to Dijon, um, because uh, they said that the, the, the Cluniacs are not following really the original rule of St. Benedict, and they were proposing to do it much better. Uh, possibly the best know of, known of them was uh, uh, Bernard of uh, Clairvaux. Um, here he's uh, uh, seen, um, as the Americans would say, beverage directly with the virgin's milk um, in a Flemish illumination. Um, the Cistercians were instrumental in, in a spreading and development and spreading of Marian worship across Europe. So when you really start seeing the, the Madonna and a child um, appearing in churches and sculpture and so on, it is with Cistercian um, churches. Uh, now, uh, Bernard joined the Cito in the early uh, 1110s, uh, so, so, you know, not, not even 15 years after its uh, founding, and it was, he was really um, crucial in founding several other abbeys in the area and establishment and acceptance of the new order, which quickly spread across the entire Europe, um, and as much as the Cluny contribute to one way of thinking and the development of arts and so on. Cistercians uh, were credited with a number of other things. Um, number one is return to the traditional monastic uh, way of life, austerity, and this ora et labora, so uh, manual labor um, and prayer. Um, Mary and Cult I've already mentioned, and uh, then they were also a fervent supporters of the Knights Templar and Crusades. This might have something to do with the fact that Bernard's uncle was a founding member of the Knights Templar, uh, but in any case, his advocacy of the Knights uh, helped them achieve the official order status within the church. And he also published this uh, manual on specific behavior for the Templar order, which had a big impact on taming an absolute army of rather violent wandering knights and wannabe knights and encouraging chivalry, which, you know, becomes a sort of a, um, a, a, a way of life in the late medieval time. Um, so in a way, it, it helped to, to tame down a little bit uh, all the violence uh, that, that was going on uh, at the time. But Cistercian reforms had far more reaching effect as well. Um, so, for example, in architecture, they completely refuted Clunia grandeur with the simple, unadorned, functional architecture. All Cistercian churches follow the same model. They are a basilica um, based on a Latin cross without a tower at the crossing. Um, and the focus is on perfect proportion, the finest stone masonry, um, 
and so, so the, there is this return to functional and rational um, as opposed to Cluny, which was sort of reaching for the excesses of the of the later Gothic. I failed to mention earlier that the Cluny three actually collapsed and had to be rebuilt before consecration because they were trying to build bigger, higher, wider, and so on. So it was Cistercians that valued function above all earthly splendor, and this particular principle spread with all of their churches being built across Europe. Now. Also with their um, quest for self-sufficiency and appreciation of manual labor, as well as academic education, uh, Cistercians did all their work themselves. Cluniacs uh, outsourced hard labor. Uh, and because they did all the hard work themselves, they were instrumental in advancing a myriad of agricultural practices from wine growing and making to breeding of animals and um, development of grange farming uh, through which then they spread their uh, innovations. So for example, here in a picture um, you see um, Claude de Vugo and this was the first wall enclosed vineyard in Burgundy. Um, and they soon understood the importance of heat radiating stones and started enclosing vineyards and actually planning where the walls will go in order to exert more heat or provide shade or basically manipulate a little bit of climate. So it doesn't sound like much. It sounds like something, well, of course, uh, but it was it, it happened here for the first time. So so they were they were, you know, improving are fruit by cross breeding. I'm not entirely sure of the vocabulary to to uh, to use here. They, they were improving all kinds of practices, which then led to you know happier, happier and better uh, agriculture. Again, across Europe, because they spread it from abbey to abbey, and uh, they also were the um, early developers of various industrialized methods of production. Uh, mostly using hydropower. So here in Fontenay Abbey, which is the best preserved Cistercian um, Abbey in Europe, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site here in Burgundy. It is it is just it's probably the most peaceful place I've ever uh, visited. Um, some things are reconstructed, some things are still uh, uh, saved, but uh, there's a reconstruction of the hydraulic. A hammer, which was used in the mass production of metal tools. This was an iron forge, and Fontenay was uh, uh, famous. It earned it earned a lot of money by making uh, metal tools. Um, so uh, in Spain, I think they had um, they, they they invented the way of using hydraulic power to to centrally heat their abbeys, but I do, I don't know the details of it. Um, but Perhaps, okay, you can argue it whichever way. One thing that maybe they got wrong was their fervent support for the Crusades, um, especially the second one, which may have never happened if the busy B. Bernard of uh, Clairvaux stayed clear of it. The first papal bull calling for the Second Crusade was issued at the end of 1145, um, and it was largely ignored. Um, and it was only after the French king Louis the Seventh consulted Bernard of Clairvaux um, that the things then got going following this chat with the Bernard um, and against the advice of his entire court and Bishop Sugar, uh, the one of the fancy chalice, Louis joined the Pope Eugene III in advocating another crusade. And there was the Council of Vesle. And uh, here on the picture, you have this um, beautiful, beautiful uh, hilltop town, Visley. Uh, the council was called in March 1146. Uh, why Visley? Because it was, and it still is, one of the key points uh, in the, on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. And in those days, uh, this Benedictine Abbey, the church of which you can still see uh, here, uh, was a, a famous pilgrimage site itself because they claim to have the relics of St. Mary Magdalene. This claim was proved false later on, but you know it, the legend still lives on. Uh, so the council was called at uh, Vesley and uh, 
Pope Eugene commissioned Bernard to preach there. Um, and uh, apparently the large, huge crowds gathered. Um, and it, it was recorded um, that his voice rang out across the meadow like a celestial organ. And when he finished, the crowd enlisted en masse. The, this, this particular event is quite strong in the, in the overall sort of um, legend of the Crusades. So you can see this painting was, was painted in the in a 19th century, but uh, uh, you know, the whole romance of it still lives. Um, unlike the first crusade, this second one uh, attracted royalty and numerous nobles and bishops. And it could be questioned whether they did it because of their religious fervor, which was evoked by Bernard's preaching, or perhaps behind the closed door, Pope's promises of foreign lands and spoils. This is, you know, it's difficult to say. I'll leave it to you to make up your mind on that. But nevertheless, um, it was the ugly spirit of colonialism that was perhaps awoken uh, with the seed was sowed in, in Vesley. Um, and it can be sensed in this fantastic inner tympanum in the church of St. Mary Magdalene, the one on a, on a hilltop, um, and which was possibly made specifically as a PR exercise to promote the idea of Christian conquest. Um, I say that because in an absolute sea of Romanesque portals in France um, that all show Christ administering the last judgment, it's only this Vesley tympanum that is absolutely unique with this imagery and, and iconography. It shows Jesus um, in Mandala. So normally this wouldn't be so such a strange representation. This You would see this in many other churches. But we don't have the damned and the blessed on each side and, you know, somebody weighing their souls. Here, uh, we have Jesus sending his apostles, telling them to go forth and uh, spread the word or go forth and, and, and conquer. Um, and he's sending them into the strange and foreign world, uh, which is illustrated in this surrounding arch that, that, that surround them. And uh, in this arch, we have this strange world, and these people are definitely not like us. You know, some of them, uh, sorry, some of them have dogs' heads, as you can see here. So they have a human body, they have a dog's heads, and the uh, apostles are approaching in a bit shock, horror, and awe. Um, and then some of them, right, this group down here um, has elephants' ears, um, or we see the man is actually covered in feathers. Um, in any case, they're very much the other. <laughs> There's not much spirit of the... Uh, United Nations to be found here. So the second crusade flopped um, and the ter third one was also launched from Vesley where the, uh, the French and English king met to ride into a sunset together. Um, and there was this period what with all this crusading and then the, the troubles with the Hundred Years War and the um, Black Death, the plague arrived of course, that Burgundy was languishing throughout the late Middle Ages, until your run of the mill succession crisis happened, and it saw the duchy revert back into the royal domain of King John II of France. And to reward his fourth youngest son, Philip, for his bravery in the battle against the English in the Hundred Years' War, um, and, and then in the captivity, uh, which they spent together, the King of France gives his son the Duchy of Burgundy, and thus starts the renaissance of the Duchy and the rise of the Burgundian Valois dynasty. And it can be argued actually starts the renaissance in general, which uh, I'll show later with some artworks. Now, mostly through very clever marriages, um, 
arranged marriages, of course, a little bit of warring and a lot of soft power and diplomacy. The Valois managed to build one of the most influential and modern states in the Renaissance Europe of the uh, 15th century. Their start up capital was not that much bigger than that of the Medici and Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, Philip the Good, Charles the Bold and Mary of Burgundy were as instrumental in the birth of Renaissance as these Florentines, um, with their legacy probably even stronger than that of the Medici. We could spend hours, perhaps days, talking about uh, their court, uh, but uh, you know, due obviously to uh, time pressures, we are forced to summarize. So I'll uh, try to be brief. And their main legacy lays in the regulation and promotion of luxury goods, something that France is still famous for today. And then incredible display of soft power of arts uh, and crafts, unseen perhaps in Europe since the fall of Roman Empire and the demise of the Byzantines. And then also conscious promotion of modern technology in every aspect of life. Um, the, the, the Valois Burgundy was a thoroughly modern duchy. Um, for example, here you're looking at the um, Arras tapestry, and the tapestries were very, very popular among the European nobility. Uh, they were beautiful. They showed off that you had money, and they kept the draft away. Um, and uh, there was, uh, I, I, wouldn't call, I wouldn't call it a mass production, but there were more and more um, newcomers onto the tapestry market. And it was the regulation imposed by Philip the Bold on the weavers of Arras and Tournai that ensured that their work became synonymous with the highest quality in their craft. They were the most expensive and with a good reason. There were no messing around with cheaper materials, with cheaper pigmentations, with, with less uh, um, stitches, knots, or, or, or whatever. If you bought Arras tapestry, you knew for certain what you were buying. Philip also regulated the production of Burgundian wine, which was already famous. It wasn't referred to as Burgundy wine, it was referred to as Bonn, after the, the city of Bonn. Uh, he, first he banned the uh, planting of Gamay, uh, which is a key wine in, in Pejolet wine. Um, he considered it to be of, of lesser quality. He considered it to be too bitter and spoiling the good, uh, the good Burgundy, which is usually red Burgundy is based on Pinot Noir. Uh, he also banned uh, uh, fertilizing to increase yield. He, he was one for, you know, less is more kind of uh, thing for reading good quality. Um, later on, his successors banned the import and export of all foreign wines. And if you think that at the same time, Burgundy geographically expanded into the into the low countries, that meant that the uh, Côte du Rhône wines could not effectively reach the Northern Europe, uh, unless going sort of round, round, round the way. Uh, which was very expensive. Uh, so if you compare at that time the Burgundian wine regulations and uh, the, the regulations that that were that, that the English were putting in place in Bordeaux, because they were kind of uh, um, in charge for, for a, a period of time during the Hundred World War, Burgundy was all about ensuring quality, while Bordeaux was about low taxation on import and export. And that tells you a lot, I think, in general. Um, various other things were regulated, um, including mustard, for example. So Philip uh, uh, rightly so decided that it should be made with vinegar, um, because it was, uh, vinegar was easier to, to control in terms of quality. Um, because up until that point, the uh, Burgundian mustard was made with the must left over from pressing wine, uh, which can go anyway. It's a very volatile thing. Um, incidentally, the Burgundian mustard is not the same as the Dijon mustard. Burgundian mustard is geographically protected, while Dijon mustard just implies a, a, a recipe and the way it, it is produced. Um, the 
Valor uh, dukes, apart from all of these regulations in terms of production, they also adopted new technology and practices with absolute gusto. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not mad on war, so I'm not going to talk much, but uh, they were the early uh, adopters of uh, a variety of new weapons in, 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 in warfare from rifles, muskets, uh, guns, and so on. Uh, but they also loved, absolutely loved clocks. Philip was, Philip owned a big clock uh, and wherever he traveled, and he traveled almost nonstop because he, he kind of took, took to Charlemagne's approach. If you're going to conquer, if you're going to rule, you have to be present. So he was almost always on the road. And uh, uh, the duchesses as well were always all, all, always on the road. And it, in all the records, it says, you know, they had these massive clocks, each duke and the duchess had their own clocks and they had their own two servants at least to take care of the clock. Um, and this is one of the, the most famous of the uh, 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 ducal clocks, uh, which uh, Philip, the, um, Philip the Bold um, took, when he helped his father-in-law, Count of Flanders, uh, uh, a sack, uh, a Flemish uh, town of Kotyk, and uh, he took it as a spoils of war in 1382 and uh, gave it to the uh, city of Dijon because Dijon sent uh, a thousand soldiers to help him in this particular uh, skirmish. So the clock was installed on the uh, Notre Dame, uh, the Dijon church, uh, still there. Now, when it arrived, it only had the mail and then it was requested by the citizen that he should get married so he got his Jacqueline and then later on he got a son <laughs> and then in the 19th century the daughter was added so now you have a whole family um, that beats the hour the half hour and the quarter and the quarter of hours, and uh, this this would have enchanted the duke without without a doubt. So there were clocks absolutely everywhere. You see them even in the paintings. Um, this is a um, um, this is a, um, a a judge. This is a courtier from the um, from one of the later dukes uh, who commissioned Roger Vadeveden, the court uh, artist, the famous. Um, a northern artist who instigated the uh, Renaissance in the northern in a northern painting, um, and here at the back, sorry, we see the uh, close up now. Here we see this uh, a, a splendid uh, machine, and on it, on this cross in the middle of the dial, it says, "As long as I live, others will not." Um, a rather daunting message, I would say. So. It was machinery, and then now it was this fantastic art that came from the Dukes of Burgundy, from their court. Uh, they had the most extravagant court, without a doubt. We know that because we have their uh, accounting. We have the contracts. We have the amount of money that was that was spent on various things, and and they spend. Uh, sometimes they spend the absolute last little cent from their treasury. Uh, but knowing that the soft power of all this resplendence will probably bring them far more than, than they could achieve with saving that one little one little coin. So um, the best artists of the North worked uh, uh, for, for the Duke, the best composers and musicians played uh, at the uh, various ducal courts, as I, as I said. The main court was in Dijon, the seat was in Dijon, but he would have had they all had palaces uh, across their across their domains. Um, he commissioned chronicles to write chronicles. He commissioned uh, uh, miniatures painters to illustrate them. Um, he had a, a, a huge workshop that was in charge of just binding and maintaining books because the ducal uh, library was the biggest uh, uh, secular library in in Europe. So um, here is an example again, Roger van der Weyden of, uh, um, a, of a writer, Jean Maquilin, presenting the famous chronic chronicles of Hinault, of the uh, county of Hinault, to Philip the Good. And it's, it's a kind of a, a, an, an example both of you know, investment in art, investment in literature, the, the 
um, intellectual status of the court, but also stressing this, you know, the chronics of Hino. It was Philip the Bold, so the first duke that married his son, John the Fearless, to, uh, to the daughter of the Count of Holland and, and Hinault, knowing that by this marriage, his grandson here, Philip the Good, will be inheriting and ruling this particular county. So we see this kind of continuation, the, the political and diplomatic thinking as well. Um, on the uh, right, that as a duke's right hand, um, is also the famous Chancellor Roland, and it is um, he perhaps more than anybody else from the courts of the dukes that, that exemplifies this Renaissance man. Uh, Roland um, was uh, 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 also a famous patron of art. Here we see uh, him in a, um, in a painting that he commissioned from Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck was also uh, a court painter at the ducal court, and uh, it, it's a spectacular painting if for nothing else, if you don't care about the detail or anything, first there is this absolute almost passport photo value of the Duke's portrait. And then the fact that he is more or less the same size as the Madonna, um, as that he puts himself at that, at that level. There's been so many interpretations, we don't have time to go into it. I mean, every square uh, inch of this uh, uh, painting can be analyzed and people to this day, the researchers are trying to explain why somebody who in his life was incredibly charitable and pious is also daring to put himself on that size and in the same room eye to eye almost with, with the Madonna. Um, but as I said, that's a topic for a whole, whole another lecture. Roland was very famous also for uh, sponsoring, for, for his charitable work and possibly for um, building what's arguably the most uh, famous building in Hall of Burgundy, which is the Hospice of Bonn. Uh, this is a, a, a hospital that he that he made for the poor, um, and when you go there, you could be excused for thinking, "Wow, you know, this is how the poor lived." Uh, you know, what, what what was it like for the rich people? Um, he he didn't uh, um, he he considered that everybody deserved the same chance, so therefore he did not spare money in creating these fabulous buildings, these fabulous structures. Um, of course, every postcard from Bonn has this uh, a roof on the left uh, 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 on it. This is a typical Burgundian roof of um, fired tiles. Uh, it's interesting to mention that by the time that he was finishing the work on his hospice, the tiled roofs became very bourgeois and the real uh, show off was to have lead tiles so on your right is the 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 bit that was the last one completed <laughs> and that has a lead roof because he really wanted to be shown as the sort of latest greatest and most modern man as well as the richest one and it it is um it's it's one of the best preserved Renaissance buildings uh, um, in Europe, and at the same time, it is quintessentially Burgundian because it combines the splendor, perhaps, of Cluny. It also with the functionality of the Cistercian and and this modernity that the dukes loved so much. Because when you go inside, you find incredible touches of of functional thing. You know, they diverted underground they diverted the waters of the nearby river so that there's a running water that takes away the waste and and possibly uh, um, keeps it much cleaner to prevent the spread of uh, of of any um, epidemics um it is it is truly an incredible building and it is a building that to this day is still sustained uh, by its vineyards and uh, uh, probably the world's most famous auction um, of its uh, of its wine and um I will finish, as I said, with my favorite artwork. Um, I, I don't know how to connect it with all of this, except with that, you know, I think they all wanted to be remembered. And uh, the first Duke uh, donated the land and built a resplendent uh, monastery just outside uh, Dijon. 
And when he started it, everybody was thinking, why on earth is he building there? It's a bit of a swampy place. And I always think about the Louis XIV, because he started to build Versailles in a bit of a swampy place. And everybody was going, what on earth is he going to do there among the mosquitoes? And then, you know, the Duke built this uh, uh, monastery, and it was probably the, in its time the most resplendent thing that Europe has ever seen. Later on, Versailles will be talked about the same. Unfortunately, the uh, monastery was largely destroyed uh, in the French Revolution. Uh, and today it still exists in bits and pieces. And it is, uh, um, it is a hospital for, for mental illnesses. And you can still see some bits of it. The key one is this uh, well of Moses. Uh, now it is enclosed in its own little, uh, in its own little room. And uh, as I said, it took my fancy long time ago when I first thought about Burgundy when I was uh, uh, studying Renaissance. And, uh, um, you know, we always talk about the Renaissance as something that the Italians invented. We talk about the Medici um, and we, we talk about Florence and Donatello and so on. And uh, little is really known of these great Burgundian masterpieces. I don't know why, whether it's a PR, whether it's a complexity of histories that then later on see Burgundy swallowed up by bits by France in fight with Habsburgs or so on. But uh, we look at these prophets um, and they are really right at the beginning of a 15th century when we, the rest of Europe is still struggling with the stifled Gothic expression. We look at these faces, we look at uh, 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 the, the face of prophet Jeremiah, which is actually the portrait of Philip the bold here holding the book. He was very short-sighted. He's really struggling. You can see how real, how realistic, how how uh, um, how kind of human these sculptures are looking. And uh, finally, you can see at the uh, prophet Zachary, which always stops me in my in my footsteps. I could stare at this particular uh, sculpture forever. He's got such an incredible face. <laughs> I know I can, uh, you know, spend an hour just uh, uh, thinking what was on his mind, what was on the mind on the mind of an artist when he created it, um, and kind of um, summers up probably also the fate of Burgundy, how it disappeared, almost as if these uh, angels above him are are kind of crying that most of these riches are going to get swallowed in a much bigger French story. Um, and that all of these protagonists are going to be somehow covered by the uh, thick veil of history and perhaps not celebrated as much as they should. Thank you very much. Nirvana, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Maybe not? No? Um, can you hear me, Nirvana? Yes. Yes, I can uh, uh, hear you. I think if people wish to um, ask the questions, they need to unmute themselves. Yeah, no. I, well, I've, I can you hear that? We, we've had several questions. Mm -hmm. I'm probably paraphrasing a few of them, but it, it, I think they revo re, you know, revolve around why didn't Burgundy make it in the future? What decisions did they do wrong that it didn't become a nation state going forward? Uh, that was certainly the plan for the Dukes of Burgundy. Uh, unfortunately, they ran out of male heirs and Mary of Burgundy married the Habsburg. And that was the end of that story. Uh, because as we know, it was uh, the land went to the first son. So when there was no son as such, uh, Burgundy reverted back to the uh, uh, French uh, state. They, they, it, 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 it didn't go peacefully, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of push and pull between the Habsburgs and the French king. Uh, so the French king eventually ended up with Burgundy as such, and the Habsburgs were left with the Low Countries. Uh, so did, that, did they was, make, was there mistakes in their decisions about the future? They got wrong that they didn't become a nation state? It was, it was quite well for them, but in those times, if you didn't have son, you didn't have son. Yeah, yeah okay. 
so um <laughs> that that was a bit problematic perhaps if the if the last duke lived a little bit longer he he was uh, very ambitious and he was looking to get burgundy recognized as a kingdom in its own right uh, and he already uh, got it to be recognized by the English crown, not as a kingdom, but as an independent entity from France, because all the way through this existence of Duchy of Burgundy, it was always perceived as a vassal of French crown. Um, and Dukes of Burgundy played a very strong political role in the rule of, of France as such. Um, but uh, perhaps you know he was he was killed in in uh, in in, a, in in fighting with the Swiss uh, at the time. Maybe if he lived longer, I don't know. Uh, maybe he would have managed something different. But he was killed. Mary of Burgundy was nineteen. Uh, she wanted to avoid being swallowed up by France. So she married Maximilian of Austria, the Habsburg, uh, and unfortunately died only five years later. And uh, and the inevitable happened, you know, the, the Maximilian claimed inheritance, the, the French the French stated that, you know, the, the Burgundy was the, the vassal and then the low countries were the, the later gained territories. So Maximilian got the right the Habsburgs got the right to the Low Countries, and France got back Burgundy. With that county of Burgundy, if you remember from the beginning, the the French Comte staying as a, as a vassal to the Holy Roman Empire to the Habsburgs, not going to um, not going to France all the way until uh, Louis the Fourteenth claimed it violently. Okay, and we've had another question about the Burgundian language. Um, in there, I, I I was curious about that uh, when I went because uh, um, of of my experiences in Provence. But there there are strong regional dialects, but they are they're like other French dialects which are mutually understandable. So there isn't there isn't one that stands. There isn't something that people speak and nobody else can understand them, which is what you might find in Provence when you go. Uh, in certain in certain places in certain villages, um, so it's 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 a standard what they call the way um, dialect, um, and uh, um, they 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 are un unlike again unlike many other places that I visited in in France where they can be <laughs> relatively unfriendly uh, and uh, not willing to engage the Burgundians. I found very friendly and always happy to uh, to chat. And then we have another question. It's probably looking forward a little bit, but I'm not sure this is true. But is the exit of many Chinese investors in Bordeaux affecting Burgundy? I can't be. I I don't know. That's that's a short answer. But I do know that again, like what I mentioned with the with the medieval law, well not mid, well 14th century laws between difference between Bordeaux and and Burgundy but Burgundy was all about quality and Bordeaux was all about taxes and duties and and whatnot basically money Burgundy um uh, Bordeaux had relatively big influx of of Chinese buying their vineyards without a blink. And uh, uh, I, I know this was before I moved in here. So I remember actually living in England and reading about it that Burgundians were apoplexic. There was like, there was a threat of, of, of mass harakiri uh, when the first Chinese investor bought uh, a minor, a minor vineyard. And I know that there are not that many. They are not selling the Burgundians hold on to their own day to this day they have very strong regulations about absolutely everything stronger than anywhere else in France so they are not that keen so I don't know I, I can't say what is happening right now perhaps they've also been horribly affected by COVID and economic uh, uh, problems and so on so whether they are happier but uh, to sell I, I don't know but it's it's certainly not the same as as uh, Bordeaux. Okay, and then we have another question. Maybe this is historical a little bit, but um, why did Burgundy become so powerful in the Netherlands? Well, as 
you know, the 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 uh, the first Duke of Burgundy, the first Valois Duke of Burgundy, married the daughter of the Count of Flanders, and that was the that was the foot in. So then he just basically carried on marrying his um, son, John the Fearless, to the daughter of the Count of Holland and Hinault, and that's basically how it spread. Um, and uh, they took control of everything, but also it was this particular way in, they, in, in which they operated. They didn't just merely sit in Dijon and issued rules. They they went there. They kept courts in Bruges. They kept uh, um, they kept courts in, in Brussels. Uh, they they went around with great parades, great pomp and circumstance, showing how wealthy they are, staging various uh, festivities, uh, making sure that the court people who were engaging with locals, whether on a a city level, on a guild level, trade, whatever it was, they were all uh, speaking both languages. So they were speaking Burgundian version of French of the time and the local uh, low country dialect, where let, let's call it the Dutch, to, not to complicate here. So, so um, they, 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 were, they were not perceived as sort of, you know, far away uh, feudal lords they were perceived as somebody who really um perhaps if it wasn't really their own because they they obviously they had very strong links to the french crown um at least uh, looked that they, they will do something for the sake of the locals as well um as for themselves okay nirvana i mean i'm conscious of time that that's been brilliant thank you very very much for a wonderful introduction and description of what's happening in Burgundy. If anybody's interested in the tour, please do contact us. But again, Nirvana, thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. Um, I, I will now close the, the meeting. If there are any additional questions we haven't answered, we'll try and do those by email. But thank you very much again to all. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.